Hello, this is Anna Maynard with the Wisconsin Apple Growers Association, and I'm pleased today to have Christelle Godot with us, who is the fruit crop entomologist and extension specialist at the University of Wisconsin. And today we're going to be talking about stink bugs, one of our favorite fall insects. So um, that's what our topic is going to be today. And we're going to start out with, Christelle, why are stink bugs a problem in Wisconsin? Oh, well, so that's a, um, a good question. And um, the sting bugs, there's a complex of them. So we don't have just one sting bug. There's a lot of sting bugs out there when you're looking outside. And what sting bugs do is that the way they feed into plants and what part of the plants they feed on, right? So for those that are a problem, they're those insects that are going to feed on your on your commodity, it could be the leaves, it could be the, the bark of the tree, it could be the nuts, it could be the fruit. And so as they feed, what they do is they have a long proboscis, that's their tongue, and they pierce into the, 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 the part of the plant that they're interested in. And then they secrete some uh, enzymes in there with their saliva that will kind of turn the flesh into juices, and then they suck that up. And the problem with sting bugs that, so not all sting bugs do that, because we have predatory sting bugs that feed on other insects, et cetera, et cetera. But those that are problematic for us, as they do that, what that means is that any kind of probing they do when they're trying to see if that's a good food will cause damage because they are inserting into that pl plant part and they're also um, secreting saliva as they're doing that to test, taste what it is. So that's the problem that we have is when they are feeding on our commodities and there any kind of probing or feeding event causes a damage. So what kind of stink bugs are a problem in apples in Wisconsin? So the main stink bugs, there's going to be four that we have in, uh, in Wisconsin that are problematic in apple. We have the green sting bug, which everybody knows it's very green. It's very... Um, they're all pretty big, so they're pretty easy to see. They're, they're not small insects. So the green sting bug is one. The brown sting bug is another one, the problem here. Then we have the dusky sting bug, and then we have brown marmorite sting bug. So those are kind of the four. There are others that could happen because they're generalists and they might end up in apple. Uh, the rough sting bug is one or another one, uh, Banassa dimidiata. But in general, those are the main ones. And talking to some apple growers that have problems with sting bug, it's the brown and the green sting bug. And then, of course, for those that have, that are unfortunate to have brown marmorite sting bug, that will be the other one. So those are the three main ones that we would have. And when do they become a problem, Christelle? So it's because we are talking about a complex, it's a little, um, not complicated, but for the most part, they overwinter as adults. So they will be either in the orchard or orchard or outside the orchard and they're hiding in places under weeds or in brush piles or bean stacks or things like that. And they're hiding there over the winter. And then in April is when they come out and they start feeding. A lot of them feed on broadleaf weeds in or outside of the orchard. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. But um, and so that's around the pink. Um, Pink to early bloom period, that they're outside on those broadleaf weeds for the most part. The green and the brown sting bugs, though, are forest dwellers. So they will be in the forests at that time, in the spring and early summer. Um, and that they're feeding on tree seeds and leaves and stems, etc. So they're not in our orchards. As you can tell, you don't have them at that time. It's mostly rare. Sometimes you have some that come out in April and go straight into the orchard and feed on the leaves or some um, like um, what's in the orchard. But for the most part, these two, the green and the brown, will be outside of the orchards in the forest. The adult brown sting bug, though, tends to live along the edges of the orchards. And it will feed on the mullein plant, the broadleaf mullein plant, the pigweed species, those that are <clears throat> very broadleaf plants that are in, in orchards. And they're feeding on flowers, stems, and plant foliage. And that's the kind that might be in, end up being a pest on many of our fruit crops because they're in the orchard. So the brown sting bug might be earlier on in the orchard. When the sting bugs are early on in the orchard, if it happens that they're coming in because they run out of food or they end up going into uh, an orchard 
by chance or something like that, um, they may deposit some eggs on the fruit trees and the nymphs might then be um, feeding on our commodities. So the early fruit, the small fruit, and that can cause cat facing like Tarnish Splendbug would do. I don't know if people really see that. I think that for the most part, we have our sting bugs coming in later in the summer, but this can happen. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so for, like I said, for the most part, they're coming in late summer when they're running out of the other vegetation that they've been feeding on. And then there's those beautiful fruits that they are coming to, uh, to feed on. Um, from those ten, that standpoint, we have a lot of an edge effect, especially from those tree dwelling um, or forest dwelling uh, green and brown marmorite sting bugs. So there is that really edge effect that people should pay attention. So that's something that we'll talk about a little more. Um, there are two to three overlapping generation each season of the green sting bug, only one of brown marmite sting bug, and possibly two of the brown sting bug. At least in Florida, they have two. So we have kind of different life histories on those. Um, brown marmite sting bug, we know we only have one generation. You might see a new generation at the end of the summer, but they will not survive. So that's kind of what we have. So it, because it's a complex of sting bugs that we're talking about today, things are a little bit different for each of those species. So, so some of the things you talked about are the damage that they cause to apple. Um, how do you know if the damage is coming from a stink bug or something else? So this is one where I would like to share my screen. So there's been talks, uh, especially with the brown marmorite sting bug, there's been so much more on sting bugs um, ever since, that um, that's the corking that they cause. So I, I don't have a picture of that corking. The damage that they cause, I forgot to put a picture of that, but you probably have seen it, it's that corking. So when you cut the fruit, you, you know, before you cut the fruit, you have those kind of depression and darkened areas. If you cut, you have that flesh that's corky and brown. And that can resemble other, um, either a, um, not even a pathogen, but like a deficiency, like bitter pit, that might resemble ha hail damage, apple maggot damage. So there's a lot of different things. So Janet Van Zoren, that was with us before, put this super nice diagram. And I refer to that in the Wisconsin Fruit News, to this article. But this diagram is, um, it's a very simple, um, to wiki. So you look at it from the top bar, top um, rectangle up here. If you have this color depression with the corky flesh, so that's what we're talking about. That's the damage that we're experiencing. If no, you don't have that. The flesh is not corky or discolored, um, only slightly discolored or maybe depressed. That would likely be apple maggot. Now, if we are in the corky flesh, is there a sting at the side of the depression? If you don't have a sting, does the corking reach the skin surface? And so that's a very important one because if it doesn't reach the skin surface, so if you cut and you have some corking in the middle of the fruit, then that's most likely bitter pit. And it will tend to also be at the bottom of the fruit, the bitter pit. Whereas the sting bug damage will be more on the top of the fruit or scattered throughout the fruit, but more towards the top of the fruit. So if the corking is separated from the skin, that will be bitter pit. And that's a, a um, a deficiency, right? A, a nutritional yeah. deficiency. If the corking is reaching the skin of the fruit, but there is no sting, then that's potentially hail damage. Okay. Okay. If you have the sting on top of it that you can see, then that's going to be sting bug damage. Okay. So, and this is what I have here. With apple maggot and sting bugs, usually the damage is on the top of the fruit and towards the edges of the orchard, like I mentioned for. Um, sting bugs, but that's true also for apple maggot. Those uh, um, spongy cells caused by the sting bugs injury are slightly discolored, okay? Bitter pit, it, it's at the calyx of the fruit, below the surface, throughout the fruit. It's not touching the skin, it might, but it's not really, it's detached from the skin, so for, it doesn't. And um, that's what I would say about that. So this, um, this graph here, I mean, it's not a graph, this diagram here, um, if you go to the Wisconsin Fruit News, I linked back to it. So the last issue of the Wisconsin Fruit News has this to help you kind of separate those kind of damages, because it's always hard when you're faced with the problem to backtrack and know what that was. 
And delopidin and sting bugs is one that's um, potentially hard to differentiate. All right. Um, are there traps for monitoring, monitoring stink bug populations? So there are, there's something that I couldn't figure out exactly what was in there um, because they, that's trademarked and they don't share that. But for example, Great Lakes IPM sells some kind of general stink bug monitoring, click, clear sticky trap. So that's one that has some kind of pheromone in there, but I don't know necessarily which, in, which stink bugs go there. I don't know though if people are using those. Um, and that will be a separate thing for brown marmite sting bug, obviously. But for the green, the brown, or the dusky sting bugs, I, I think that people could use those. I don't know how good they are at really monitoring those populations. But because those populations are usually more um, um, aggregated and at the edges of the orchard, and those insects are pretty big, for the most part, people can see them. So I don't think that people are using monitoring traps for them, but they are, there are some that are available if people were interested. Um, you can also look for um, frass or excrement from the sting bugs um, that they are depositing while they're feeding. That's something that you can do. There are bee tray samples that some people are taking, but it's not very practical because you're, when the fruit is mature and you don't want to be beating on the branches and have fruit drops. So that might be uh, a problem but you would want to do something monitoring and really paying close attention where you have a history of the damage or where you have those um, broadleaf uh, plants that are near the, the edges of your uh, orchard because you might have a, a, a more of a chance of having a, a higher population. So in the, on those plants, on those broadleaf plants or um, herbaceous hosts, you can do a sweeping, right? And see if you have um, any kind of sting bugs. For brown marmorate sting bugs, if you are worried or if you've seen them before, then it's highly recommended to monitor. And um, <clears throat> I've talked about that in the past. There's the pyramid trap, but then there's also those clear sticky panels, which is the common kind for sting bugs and much cheaper. Um, and so those are recommended with the pheromones that are available commercially and work really well um, to purchase and, and really uh, have in your orchard. You will not be attracting many more sting bugs than you would if you didn't have the trap like the Japanese beetle. There's yeah. always that concern and especially for people that deal with Japanese beetle, we have that in mind. We always think about that. In this case, I've talked to Tracy Lasky several years ago about that and she said no. It outweighs the monitoring, far outweighs the, the risk of having a, a couple more sting bugs that are going to come in that would not have come in in the first place. So I would highly recommend to monitor for brown marmorant sting bug. And I'll show you that at the end, a map of where we have them. That's in the last newsletter article too. Um, so that's something we can talk about after. Okay. So we've talked about where they are and what they are and injury they cause. So let's talk a little bit about how we control them. So what are some cultural things growers can do to control them? Yeah, and the cultural control for some of those, I think I was reading it for the brown, brown sting bug, not the brown marmorated. For some of them, the insecticides don't work so well. So it's not really like the main way that people are managing them. They're aggregated, they're spotty. So spot sprays is something we'll talk about later. But if you wanted to control, because they like those broadleaf plants, it would be to manage that weedy vegetation in and around the orchard. That's something that... Um, is recommended in a lot of places. And I think for people that really don't want to rely right away on insecticides, that's something to think about. Uh, the ground covers under your uh, trees, right? Manage that. So around your orchard, under, your, in the, and under the canopy of your trees, manage those broadleaf plants. You don't want to mow them, those cover crops or weeds, when the sting bugs are present, because then they're going to go up in your trees. Right. So there's yeah. also that. So you want to manage them earlier on. But once you have them, you do not want to mow because a lot of insects do that. You cut their host, they go to another host. And the closest is going to be your crop. Um, what I found is that um, there's, uh, there's been some work. So first on brown, brown sting bug, people have looked at that in Florida, looking at trap crops. And then there's been a quite a bit of work for brown marmorate sting bug. And so um, there's a little bit of overlap actually on those. In Florida, what this suggests for all of their nuts and, and tree fruit 
is a trap crop of buckwheat, sorghum, millet, or sunflower. So I haven't seen the research. I didn't go really to dive into the research. This is more from an extension standpoint. But that will intercept those sting bugs, those brown sting bugs that are coming into the orchards. Um, and so I don't know as far as the efficacy, but that's what they're recommending in Florida. So that's something people should think about. Now, going really more to the studies, there's been a couple studies on trap crops for brown marmorid sting bug, but that doesn't mean it only targets brown marmorid sting bugs. They like those same kind of host plants. So they did the study focusing on brown marmorid sting bug, but also found other sting bugs. And so those were conducted in um, the Mid-Atlantic, or the second one, I forgot where that was done. So the first one in the Mid-Atlantic, that was around apple orchards, and they looked at sunflower, sorghum, and others. But the two main ones were the sunflower and the sorghum, where they planted those as a trap crop, and they didn't go into the detail yet about how to implement that. But the sunflower weed would attract them. Then as that senesces, then they go into the sorghum. And that was covering a five-week period where those BMSB and other sting bugs were found in those. So that attracted them there. I don't know that they looked at how much, um, like the impact on the damage. Do you have less damage in your orchard by having that trap crop? It wasn't um, something that I saw there, but that's the important part as well. But it was working pretty well and they were pretty happy because that five week attraction is really during the time of peak activity of Brahmar and Stingbug. So there's the overlap, right, of the sunflower that that's recommended for brown sting bug that worked for BMSB and for other sting bugs. They were getting a lot of, they had for the sunflower, the sorghum, they had one and a half to five times more in the sorghum than they did in the other crops. But again, I didn't see the impact that had on the damage in the orchard. I don't think they were to that extent. And I could be wrong on that. Um, they also, another study, they tested that uh, with Brahma and sting bug in peppers. And so they saw that the sunflower was attractive. And so that was working well from that standpoint. But when they looked at the damage in the peppers, there was no difference between the sunflower treated or the sunflower not treated. So there's, a, there's more that needs to be done. And I might not be up to date on all of that um, because those were from 2015 and 2016. So um, there might have been more work done with that. I would say something to think about, to consider, and I, can, I, I will look a little more into this, but I think that that is, has a, a strong potential of helping with sting bugs. What about um, biological controls? So on the biological controls, we have, I mentioned at the very beginning that not all sting bugs are bad, right? And we know that because there's too many insects of any of kind, but we have some predatory sting bugs, such as the spine soldier bug. Um, these are, generalist predators that will feed on the eggs or immatures of other insects, including other sting bugs. Hmm. So these tend to be with a shorter proboscis and stouter than those plant feeding sting bugs because they need to be very thin to go into the plant, um, plant juices. But so that's the case that you will have um, some predatory sting bugs. <clears throat> we have egg parasitoids that help um, some um, wasps that will help decrease populations. And in some cases, I think it was in Florida when I was reading there that they're saying those predatory um, uh, wasps, or not predatory, parasitoid wasps, do a pretty good job at maintaining those populations to low levels. So that goes back to our, um, our um, insecticide sprays. We have to be careful to make sure we maintain those native biological control agents. We have tachinid flies that are also parasitic flies. Um, that attack our native sting bugs and lay eggs on them. Um, so there's, there's a, put, a good potential for biological control to already be present in your orchard and around. Um, then there's, of course, brown marmorid sting bug, and I've talked about that. So the native um, biological control agents for sting brown marmorid do some kind of a job, but not a great job. And the most hope we have for BMSB is really that uh, samurai wasp, the Trisulcus japonicus, that was going to be introduced to the US and then was found uh, by just um, accidental introductions, not intentional, um, was found in multiple parts of the US. So we do have 
um, uh, parasitism that already occurs from this uh, wasp onto our uh, brown mine sting bug. When we had our study, I presented that at the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Conference, where we looked at eggs of brown marmite sting bug in orchards, we did find parasitism by other parasitoids. So we do know they are there, and they're not going to discriminate so much, the native ones, between a brown marmite sting bug and the, the uh, sting bugs we have here, the natives. So we have them. We do have parasitoids and biological control uh, predators that are there. So something to keep in mind uh, as we move into chemical control. All right, conventional and organic, what kind of chemical control do we have? So we, as usual, we have quite a few and I'll share that. But there's been, uh, in multiple places, people say it's hard to control sting bugs with insecticides because they're sporadic in nature, um, it, it's hard to know where they're going to be, to predict where they are, they're spotty. So, and then more will move into the orchard, right? We know that happens for like Japanese beetle, and that's the case um, with, um, with sting bugs as well. So again, the concentration on the edges is something important to think about because that might be where you target your sprays. So you want to really look at that. And also, if you have a history of damage, you know they're in that area, then you really pay attention to that. And be alert during those critical times, which is late summer in Apple. Um, there are numbers of materials that will kill the sting bugs on co contact and provide residual control for the new migrant, though, becomes difficult. So that's the part where you can kill those that are here, but those that are coming after a little bit harder to. Uh, so you have to repeat your applications. For brown marmorate sting bug, what has been looked at is, because of that edge effect, is to spray the outer rows. And that came up to 85% of effectiveness. So that, that works pretty well. So intercepting them, again, there's the trap crop, then there could be those spot treatments. So everything is gonna be, we're talking about integrated pest management. These are all the tools. How do we put them all together to try to uh, uh, minimize those populations? So the trap crop at the edges, then on top of that, you do spot sprays at the edges where they might be spilling over from either the forest or even the trap crop, some of them move in, and you do those perimeter sprays is something that could be uh, very much implemented. Okay, so let me just do, I'm gonna share my screen, but my table was across two pages. So let me do this. This table, I didn't try to change it so much. That's the one I put in the last article for um, brown marmorate sting bug. Because all sting bugs, we use the same kind of products for all of them. So I double check them, but that's the case for pretty much all of our sting bugs. So we have our pyrethroids are the one that provide the most excellent control. By no means is this an exhaustive list. There are more out there that you can find in your spray guide. But we have um, Actera is one that has an excellent uh, activity for um, sting bugs and uh, Lanate is another one that's been rated excellent. Of course, you want to look at your uh, pre-harvest intervals uh, because we're getting close to harvest. But we have quite a few products with different mode of action, so that's pretty good. I think that for brown marmorate sting bug, that's been pretty um, with people using. So just in case people are forgetting that, the provisional um, uh, threshold for an insecticide application for, for BMSB is 10 adults or nymphs per trap per week. Right? So that's kind of what they're using in the Mid-Atlantic region. With those insecticides, they've been able to really decrease those populations and, and have a handle on them. For organic production, it's, um, these are kind of the products that we have available to us. We have Azera. Um, that's a combination of pyrethrin, which is pyganic, um, and azadirectin, which is what you have in Nemex, and azer, um, azadirectin, and a couple others. So these um, active ingredients, the pyrethrin and the azadirectin, are the ones that have the most efficacy for our sting bugs in, um, for sting bug control. And the surround, the kaolin clay, has been shown to work fairly okay. 
granted, it's always the same. If you compare one for organic production to one that's in the conventional, you can't have them in the same table because then it would look like just good in organic production. Then what becomes excellent within organic production would be those products. They would be the best products that you can try. Um, Azera has been one that uh, people have felt was pretty good. So it's a combination, uh, but it's, it's one that people um, tend to like for organic production. So again, this table is in the last article I did in the, fr the fruit news about um, brown marmorated. Okay. Is there anything else that I forgot to ask or that growers should know about stink bugs? Okay, well, I need to share my screen again. That's also in the, in the last newsletter. But I just want to focus a little bit on brown marmorated because as much as we don't want to talk about it so much, it's here. So um, I want people to make sure, I said it earlier, but make sure if you are in one of those orange counties, that's where they have been confirmed. This is as of February, 2020. And then the yellow are suspected, but you can imagine that counties, I can't remember which county is in the middle here, but they're pretty much starting to be established everywhere. They might not reach so much the Northern part. If you're in one of those counties, I would highly recommend to monitor and be very um, cautious about what population you have because we don't want to be too much forgetting that they're there and then end up with a, a major problem. So that's what I would say. I would say if you're in one of those counties, make sure that you pay attention to BMSB as well because you might have it in your orchard and you might not notice it and that might be bad news at some point. The numbers are not so high, but we've had a, a grower a couple of years ago now that reported 30% damage from brown marmorate sting bug. So it's mm. not like it's not here. I think that we, we tend to, you know, wait until it's a problem. So I just want to make sure that people are aware that they are spreading, they are here and they'll stay. They're not going anywhere. Okay. So, Christelle, how do people get a hold of you if they have a question and you referred to the fruit newsletter, can you just remind them of where that's located at? Okay, so um, the Wisconsin Fruit News, that's one that, Anna, you will forward to growers. It's yep. one that we put together every two weeks. And um, if you go to, if you type in in Google, Wisconsin Fruit Program, you'll get to the website and under news, that's where there's all those articles. And there's also a tab for um, Apple. I can show you that. So this is where we have, this is our Wisconsin Fruit News. So the home would be like this. It's fruit.wisc.edu. So it will look like this. And then under, so you have the different crops here. You can click on Apple and go to the page of Apple and have a ton of information in here on any topic that you're interested in. And then if you go into, uh, oops, I clicked home instead of news, news, now all of our articles come as their independent article. So you can get them in the newsletter and click on the specific article you're interested in. It's not a PDF, I mean, you can have a PDF too, but we have them much more accessible. And then they're posted here. That's where it will take you if you click on it. So here, preparing for brown marmorate sting bug. That's the one I've been referring to. So it has this map that I mentioned. It has the link here to the previous article with that uh, diagram on how to differentiate damage. And then the insecticide table that I um, provided earlier. So um, this is where you can find a lot of information. The best way to get a hold of me is really going to be <clears throat> by emailing me. And my email address is gedo at whisk.edu. Um, as far as calling me, the number that's available is my office number, and I'm not going into my office, obviously. <clears throat> so if you really have a problem, you can always email me, and I'll give you my cell phone number. I just don't want to have it just out and about uh, for anybody that's going to click on this, because these videos end up on YouTube, so then people can see. Anybody can access those. Um, and actually, maybe I can show you that as well. This is our YouTube channel. <clears throat> That's been pretty nice that we've had this since this year. 
So this is our YouTube channel that from Apple Gores, you probably have ended up here already, the Wisconsin Fruit YouTube channel. And this is where we have um, the videos that were on irrigation systems that you talked about. That's where everything is housed. So this video will end up here. It has our grape webinars, our berry webinars, or cranberry. So anything we do is here. So Perfect. if you're if you want to access that, it's um what's the name of this? Yeah, it's tricky. You can't really type it, but it will be just the Wisconsin Fruit YouTube channel. Okay, that's great. All right. So thank you, Christelle, for updating us on stink bugs, and hopefully we'll have a less stinky fall. How's that sound for a joke? <laughs> that sounds really good. <laughs> well, thank you, Anna, for doing this. This is great.